Zork. Back then it was just called Zork, it wasn't Zork 1 yet. It was just Zork and the little plastic bags. Um, and then, you know, we played it in the store. That's the thing that was funny is, uh, you know, you know, back then it was like a, a Tira City Model 3 was like two grand. And uh, that didn't happen in my in, until I got a Commodore later that year. So we, we played the preloaded one that was on the store's computer. Or well, not preloaded, from the floppy disk. And they had a box of disks next to the desk there. So that was that was it. So that and uh, done. And, and it was like a drug habit, but but a good one. Yeah. And, and in fact, I got a Commodore later that same year, a Commodore 64, as a bar mitzvah gift. And until then, I was playing it in the store and other games like the Big Five and other guys at the time that put out games for Tiras 80. And uh, we would uh, exchange volunteer time in the store for computer time. And being 12, that probably broke up every labor law in the book. So we'd hang up on the pegs the uh, LEDs and the you know adapters and the BNCs and that kind of thing, and um, you know and to exchange we would get to hang out in the store we'd meet a few and a few friends and we'd play Zork one and the other games well it was Zork at the time in the store until I got my Commodore 64 the one of the first Scott Adams full page ads with the pretty blonde girl holding her arms out like that. I remember like from from memory. Um, and like, well, I gotta try that. That's, that sounds cool. Not because of the blonde girl necessarily, but because that, you know, a different kind of venture game. And I had heard of Scott Adams and I, you know, and I did play a few of his games on uh, a friend's Vic 20, you know, and uh, Scott Adams games, a couple of them grabbed me, but there were so many of them, you couldn't get to them all. Um, and I, I like Scott, him and I talk quite often. Um, but Scott, don't, get, don't be upset, but I like the games have come a little more. No offense. But I did play a lot of them, I bought a lot of them, and I collect, my friends and I would collect them. And uh, my friend would get Zork 2, and then I would get Zork 3, because there were, were some bucks back then. 50 bucks, and you're 13, 14 years old, you know, that's, that's some coin. So we would take turns buying them, and uh, we'd play them at our, each of the houses, and we'd sit there looking at, at the big blue TV screen. That's the Commodore blue, white letters. Okay, uh, placemat, letter opener, near the dragons, how do we do with this? Uh, and no, we didn't see the movie at the time, we didn't know that that was done already. So we didn't know what to make of it. So my friends and I would crack the code together. It was kind of fun, like Zork parties. It was a lot of fun. And we did that throughout our teen years. And uh, he lived a few blocks away from me in Brooklyn and we go over there and say, okay, let's sit down and look at this thing. And we would often do it together in terms of, okay, now what? Well, I think we should go over here. No, no, no. Well, what about, you know, I didn't, it didn't grab me. I mean, no, no offense to, you know, to Hollywood, but it just didn't work for me. But, you know, that's how we often did it. Oh, well, solitary also. I played a lot alone. And Zork and the Raider Shack, you couldn't play alone because you had three guys on your shoulder. No, dude, you know, you, you, the, the full piece of plastic, you got to, you know. So, uh, solitary, and it was, it was a team sport, too. It, well, most people would not imagine that it could be. When I bought Return to Zork from an old computer store, which still exists as a company today in Long Island, um, I bought Return to Zork, and the on-screen mapping to me, like, blew my mind, because I never drew maps. In fact, yesterday out came the guy with such a piece, and he quoted me twice. Howard, you drew maps. Like, like it was a startling revelation that I would never do that. I never did. You know, I'd look at a map, yeah, that's what I thought it was, you know, that kind of thing. The on-screen mapping I found amazing. And uh, the atmosphere of the game and the, the, the writing and how it was set kind of like in a tourist attraction kind of thing with the Misnia port and... The Elements of Return to Zork, really, really great. One of my favorites. Uh, Enchanter was another one that hooked me. You know, we were looking for Zork 4, and, you know, Status Line, New York New York Times said, well, no, it's not Zork 4, but it is Zork 4. But it's, it's Enchanter, but it's Zork 4. And we said, it's Zork 4. You know, that was our conclusion. That was, you know, that was the, the pro proclamation. And so that hooked me, too. And then I think that moment in the game where you see the adventurer through the mirror, I was like, oh, wow. I mean, this hooked me. So Enchanter... Return to Zork, Zork, of course, that will always be. Zork 2, Zork 3, yes. No, Zork 3, lesser extent. It kind of, I played it, liked it, enjoyed it. It was a culmination of forces, all converging into one time and place. As a diehard Infocom fan, um, and an internet guy back in the days of Mosaic and Lynx, people will go, what's that? You know, Lynx text is a text web browser, and I use it on Delphi. What's that? No, never mind. <laughs> and then Mosaic... And then, of course, the big guys later on. And I was like, hey, you know something? This internet looks like a pretty good place. And it has a lot of stuff here. And a lot of fans are converging. Let me just do some searching here. But, of course, I couldn't Google it. There was no Google back then. So um, it might have been Yahoo or one of those guys. Or, and uh, I discovered the internet fiction news groups. And I'm like, wow, cool, a whole thing. And then I said, you can make new ones. And here's Inform and 
set of tools and libraries, compilers, and a whole community of people that do this. I was, I was blown away. And I joined the community and um, quickly realized there was a very, very big departure of philosophy. And, you know, that kind of led me to go my own way, yet remain somewhat in tune with some things like some technology. I'll, f I'll find a bug in the library or that kind of thing. And it was those tools and that search for Zork stuff, Infocom stuff, Legends, Lore, games, uh, whatever, any new games that uh, triggered me. I think, I don't know if I have the sequence right, but I was in the mall just doing my own thing with my girlfriend at the time and uh, walked past the computer game store and I walked in and I'm like, Infocom, what? In the 90s? Hey, hang on here a second. I got Lost Treasures Volume 1. And I was like, this is the coolest thing I've ever bought. And I meant it. It was like, I could not believe I can get these games again. I thought they were gone forever. And then I found out through the news groups, there was eBay. And then eBay, any game I didn't already have on the CDs, or I wanted the packaging. Then I began eBaying to rebuild my collection. Because as a kid, I didn't put the same stock in it as I do today. And before I know it, I have the old games. I have a way to make new games. I have a community of, of developers that don't agree with Infocom philosophies, by and large. And I discovered lots of other people that want these kinds of games, but could not get them anymore. And I mean by kinds of games, I mean Infocom-style games, in that, in that tradition, if you will. So I said, wait a minute. And I'm, at this point, I'm a businessman. I'm you know, making a capitalist living in America. People want something. They're not getting it. I can supply it. Light bulb, bing, let's, let's make brand new games in the Infocom tradition and sell them to people who want them. And Valencia was born. Orson Scott Card talked about this in one of, the, one of his books on how to write. And I, I read a lot of them because uh, no matter how good you are, you always get better. And he said, he said the same thing. Where do you get your ideas from? And I'll say online at the checkout line. And he said that in his book. And I turn me true. I'm at Costco about a month or two back. I'm online on a Sunday, which is a big, big mistake in Costco. And I grab a magazine, look at elephants in the cover. Everyone's being slaughtered. And I'm thinking, well, I have a big, bad person in Pintari the Apprentice. And I think, well, how can I enlighten people and make them aware of this tragedy of elephants being killed for their tests for no good reason other than a money thing? And uh, in a 30 seconds, I have a whole puzzle in my head worked out online at Costco with a wagon full of stuff. I'm like, yeah. I would have heard of elephants next to a watering hole because elephants need water. And then the article talked about that in National Geographic. That was the magazine I was reading. And I think, I'll, okay, I'll implement a watering hole, herd of elephants, and then a baby elephant shot by accident by an arrow because they're shooting for mom with the big tusks. Came 30 seconds. The whole thing was mapped out. And the solutions, I, multiple solutions, I put it in about three or four different ways that the player could solve that puzzle. And I made it, I made it an easy one. I, it was a giveaway. You know, you cast this spell, zap, problem solved. You know, but the point was not to challenge the player and mess with their head. That comes later. It was more a matter of bringing awareness to the public, invoking feeling for the baby elephant that was an innocent victim of this. And, you know, mama elephant's there and she's really upset. And elephants, I actually sure a show on this on PBS recently about the whole elephant community. And writing comes from feeling. So not that I'm getting off topic about elephants and their habits and the social things, but those feelings inspired me. And I said, wow, I'm going to make an amazing puzzle, and I'm also going to, to give people some enlightenment and uh, kind of like insert my, my, I don't know, agenda. You know, not that I'm a PETA, you know, member, that kind of thing, but it is wrong. And I said, I'm going to make this presentation to people of that and let them work through it and give them a nice score for doing a good deed. And it came online at Costco, the whole thing. And it could be anywhere. Sometimes I'll sit in my home studio, where I typically do my implementing, and I'll just stare at the screen and think. And I'll just think, and I'll say, I, want, I should code some rooms. I should make some objects. I have to do this. I, this room is not populated of anything. I'm like, no, but you have to take it further. What's after this room? What's the next turn going to be? What are you going to do next? So I'll just sit there and I'll just think. And, uh, Sometimes I'll just walk away or I'll, you know, play on my Atari or I'll go play Ultima Online for a little bit or I'll, or I'll go walk out in the patio, read a book, watch a show, and then, hey, yeah, bing. If I'm actually at the keyboard and I'm in, I'm in, the, I'm in my mojo, as I call it, 
things will sometimes just come and it'll, it'll flow and I'll be there for four hours straight and I just won't stop because it's just going, going, going. And it's so like I'm on fire. I'm thinking, is it the coffee? Is it the fish oil? Is it, is it the uh, Red Bulls? You know, don't know, but it just keeps on going. So sometimes the trickle, sometimes it's, it's a flood. But and the inspiration comes from anywhere and nowhere and at any given time. Uh, when I was younger, I dabbled in creative writing. I got A's in all my courses in school. And professionally, no, never professionally written, although I was very good in English. And I was very literate. And even letters I'd write to friends would be things they'd keep just because they're interesting. And, uh, you know, although my writing, like the guys at Ifacom and MIT, they weren't writers. And look what they did. I said, well, they can do it. Well, why can't I do it? I like books. I like reading. I can write well socially and communicatively so let's do it professionally and uh, I did realize though I should develop some more professional um, skills so I did get some books and I studied the craft of writing from different professors from England and uh, Stephen King wrote a great book on the subject and Orson Scott Card wrote a book so I, I kind of took the other side of the of the desk and said well okay I, I love how books are written I, as a reader but can I write them better as a writer because we kind of knew this, this you know, pro writing business. So I read a lot of books. I still do on game design. Also, Bob Bates wrote a great book on the subject and I integrated all that. And I, and I, you know, took that new set of skills and, and that new knowledge base and made that work for me. Yeah. In fact, that happened recently with uh, a puzzle in the first mile. There's a very nice lady. Um, you can Google it enough. You'll find her. She's nice. And I like her and we, she ended up hating me and now she likes me. Good. I'll take it. What happened was is that there's a puzzle in the first mile involving a gunman in the woods. And she went ballistic over the way I wrote that. Oh, that isn't fair. You shouldn't have done it like that. And, you know, why did it have to be that way? And I didn't know you had to do that. And if I knew how to do that, I would So that's why we made hints. But I, I told her, it isn't like you couldn't lose the game. You can do that incorrectly and still win. You wouldn't get the perfect score, but you would still be able to go on. And if it isn't the point, and I, I'm like, oh, oh, look, look, look. You know, and then we had a discussion constructively about her perspective of it. And that's why I tell my customers, email me your game hints. I want to hear this. What's right? What's wrong? What stumped you? What was too easy? That never happens to you. Really easy. <laughs> too easy. Except for the elephant at the watering hole. But that was, a, that was a giveaway. But, and I want to hear that feedback. Am I on target? Am I losing you? Or is it too hard? You know, the uh, Jaguar room in Azteca, same thing. I get predictably the same email all the time about the Western Wall. But people tell me once I give them the right hint or I nudge it or just give it to them, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that, that, that's a fair puzzle. But then the, the gunman one was uh, strikes me. So, yes, I hear back with you know, shoulda, woulda, coulda, and what, why didn't you, and why did you, and how come, and that kind of thing. And it's interesting because it makes me stop and think about what my customers are, are experiencing and how they're feeling and how they're thinking. And I go, aha, I can make it a little better next time. Everybody that invest their money in a Valencia game as a customer. Therefore, they are entitled to the platinum treatment, not less. So if a customer tells me about an issue that they don't, that they found to be not their liking or to their liking, either way, I, I pay very close attention to every word they say because they're spending money on my titles. So they're very important to me. Then they're the fans. And usually there's a very, very large crossover, thank goodness, of fans and customers. And I'll get fan mail about this, and I love the descriptions, and aha, doing that right. Okay, puzzles will love it. You know, it, you know like uh, First Light, someone said, the puzzles make sense, so they fit this, the plot. Like in Zork, it was all over the place. Now, I, you know, we ought to forgive that. You know, they were on brand new terrain, so I totally forgive that. They didn't do anything wrong it's to even to forgive. But, um, so fans and customers are different but the same like every customer that buys a game um i look at them as will they be a fan too and uh we go from there for the most part you know i subscribe to the graham nelson theory you know the players bill of rights and the, the average community crafted up and i don't agree with all of it but this one i agree with is the game must be fair if you mess with their heads if you want to be sadistic you're not going to have a lot of happy people in your hands and games are meant to be fun if they're not fun people aren't happy so I go with the player's bill of rights that a game must be fair. The barrel should not roll too fast. Ergo, the puzzle is not too hard and plausible. If in Greystone, for example, you're trying to solve a number of murders. I won't say how many. That'll spoil part of the fun. So you're, you're solving a number of different murders. And on the grounds of Greystone, which I, I've been there a few times doing my research, it's a vast, well, it was a vast complex. Now it's mostly been erased the ground mostly. 
it's a vast complex. And there are, were, well, maybe there still are patients there that have mental disabilities of all kinds. And, uh, and there's staff and there's people across the street living in houses. Like, wow. And, of course, implementing again, all the ideas came to me in a flash. Starting, in, by the way, in a waiting room of a doctor's office. Back to that other question there. You know, it's anywhere you go. So what happens is, is that you write a game and you say, what's fair about this? Or I write a puzzle. Nah, that's too hard. Make, you know, kick it back a notch. Because I want it to make sense, plausible, like, you know, the Western Wall and the Jagger Room. Oh, yeah, that's right. I should have thought of that. You know, not to the point where, well, if I stand in the 15th room in the eastern corner holding a purple saucer and I say Shazam, I'll get the magic key. Well, that's not fair. I mean, you know, it's got to flow right. And uh, although I will say in Second Dawn, uh, the game will be brutally unfair and people should even buy it because it'll be just like a, masoch a masochistic attempt at selling puzzles that are ridiculous. No, it is not that. But I'm going to make Second Dawn very hard. I don't know if I should say this. So I'll put it I'll put it out there and maybe we'll discuss it. Douglas Adams actually did not do a heck of a lot on that game, and God bless him. He rest in peace. Very talented man. I have every book he wrote except for the, for the that one that little one. But never mind. And um, he didn't do much work in it. In fact, to get the thing to market, they had to do all kinds of magic motions and things like that. In fact, I, I had to check my emails. One of the founders told me something that I never knew and is not on the internet and I'm not sure if I should even bring it out. I'm, he didn't say I, sh I shouldn't bring it out, but uh, I won't bring it out. I'm going to bow to my predecessors, the great ones, and I will not divulge that. I will only say that Douglas Adams did far less work on the game than one may expect reasonably. And I will also say that's just how he was. It wasn't to say if Ocom is was his back burner or whatever. Um, he notoriously blew deadlines in every book he ever wrote. Nothing was ever on time. He made his editors bonkers. I mean, his publisher was at was like pulling their head out of their head, but he worked at his own pace. You know, Douglas Adams literally did what he wanted when he wanted, and when he did it, he was amazing at it. And uh, so I can't, I cannot fault uh, Douglas Adams in any way, shape, matter, or form because it wasn't his fault. It was simply part of his character. And Infocom had this game, you know, that was how to come to market, they have their timelines, and we have a writer that's not really getting on board with this too much. So they, I think they did the best they could with what they had, and they had a lot of challenges to overcome. And I think they did a very good job. Although I will also admit on camera that I never did finish that damn game. I take it from the point of view of what a reader would, would, would like. Readers finish books. They don't buy and put them on the shelf. Well, some do. I have like 20 books I've yet to get to, but I will one day. Until I do... I have every expectation and belief that I'm going to finish every book in every shelf and every table in my house. And that's what every reader has an expectation of. And with Malenche's new games, that is my goal. Games that can be finished. In fact, um, I will echo Mr. Moriarty's, I'm sorry, Grandmaster Moriarty's, be more proper, assessment with my own current experiences with, with my company that... Um, hint requests go so far, but I will say from what we can tell, better than half make it to the end and want to make it to the end. And I think that's in response to the fact that we gear more towards the reading audience than the gaming audience. The gaming audience says, yeah, that was pretty fun, yeah. I don't have to see more. Coconut Quindor, you know, not, not important. Urguru, whatever. You know, um, but readers want to see what happens next. And that's the very craft of good writing. What happens next. If you have the reader asking the question every turn, they will want to finish it. What happens next? And that is what I do. I more write than create a game because I want to hook the reader. I want them to finish it because I'm telling a story and I want the story to be enjoyed from the beginning to the middle to the end. If I was making movies, I'd want the same thing. Don't walk out middle, please. I would be rather hurt if you did that. So I always write as if I'm writing a regular piece of fiction hook it with interactive elements that make the reader really drawn in, and then keep them going along until they finish it to the end. That, that is what I shoot for. This is my favorite. Um, let's see. We're in Chicago at Book Expo America, and we're the only people in the entire exhibit hall with laptops displaying stuff on them. Computer games? Nope. Interactive fiction. What?
you know, they people have this connection. Computer, game, you know, or ebooks maybe, but that's still kind of coming. Um, the perception is from a lot of people's point of view is what is it? And I think I've spent more time and resources trying to write uh, marketing um, facts. What is it? What is it? How do you? What is it? It's a fictional experience that any reader will enjoy. That is what it is. Um, if I'm going to walk over to a kid who's playing Halo 2 on his Xbox 360 and say, hey, kid, I'm going to try a new game. Sure, what do you got? Pentar the Apprentice. What's it about? Well, this is a young wizard in a, in a wizard's guild, and he's, you know, his master is captured during his final exams to become a true sorcerer, and you have to go rescue him, and then you have to go to this evil, dark city of mages and conquer an evil queen. Sounds great. Let me have tried it. And they sit down at the keyboard, and, hey, did it crash? You'll see his text on the screen. No, it didn't crash. That's the game. <laughs> no, no, it is. There's no graphics on the screen. Dude, kid, that's the game. You know, that's the misperception. Is it a game? Is it? Is it? Is it a DOS screen? In fact, one little girl wrote me up, 13, 12, and uh, said, this game sucks. It's a DOS game. And I'm like, first I'm thinking, she can't be a kid because kids don't know about DOS, 12-year-olds, mostly. And then her mom got involved, or her grandmother or something, and we had a whole conversation about what is a game and what is not a game. And I gave them their money back. We have a guarantee of 60 days money back at all of our titles. Gave her money back. Sorry, there was confusion. I do apologize. Uh, you didn't get what we wrote about. So I try to be clear to return. Interactive fiction is a text adventure game. And I even have screenshots where there's not one freaking picture on any of them. Just read. And we try to do a screenshot of a very important section, which actually has the reader going, wow. What does happen next? That's the hook. And uh, the, the big thing is clarification. What it is and what it isn't. It's not a com In fact, I have people buy Greystone expecting to see graphics. So I say novel, crime fiction, novel, murder mystery, uh, author, writer, novel, re reading, prose, and still think, where are the graphics? I'm like, oh, what, do I, what do I do? Uh, most keep it because they go, you know something? I read the opening screen and I, it got me. I'm going to keep this. I, it wasn't what I was paying for, not what I expected to get, but I'm going to, I'm going to keep this. And uh, so the battle continues. Although I think at this point, with our mission statement we put out a few months ago, we try to be very clear to people what this is, what is the cutting page, the welcome page, the fact page, the individual product pages. At every turn we're saying is this is what it is. No graphics, no pictures, no sound effects, no music, no beheadings. Well, at least in the first mile, that could happen. Well, never mind. And um, that kind of thing. But it's, it's going to continue because there's still that correlation is games equal graphics. So they are text adventure games. But I think that's why the term interactive fiction was coined, to make a bit more of a distinction because as graphics developed in the late 80s and STs and Amigas came out and, you know, that kind of thing, they said, well, you know, please don't expect to find graphics in this because you're not until they made, you know, the latest games in Facom where they kind of went there. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to go there. Please. Is, what does the average computer game cost? Just for shits and giggles. Not that we use a comparison, but it is computer entertainment. What's that running these days? 30, 40, 50 bucks. But the bigger benchmark is, what does a hardback book go for? 24, 29, even 30s if the book is big enough and the paper is a certain quality and whatever it is. So um, we use that as a pricing model. And uh, when, in fact, when we were at Chicago's uh, Book Expo America, me and Jimmy were in the hotel room that night after like, like a $1,000 steak dinner at some insane restaurant. Great, great food, though. I, I would do it again in a minute. Because we were celebrating how we were so well received at the show, and like we were getting little bookstores signed up, independents, and this and that. Very, very easy model. And then along comes this nice lady. I can get you in a Barnes and Noble, Borders, everywhere you want to go. I'm like, I was excited, but I was like a little older and wiser. What's this going to cost me? And then to talk about it, and we had a little, you know, meeting there right, right at our booth, and. Jimmy's nodding his head a lot, and I'm hearing it, and I'm letting him do more talking because, you know, you don't want the big boss man saying yes. I want him to say no, and then I can, whatever, you know, negotiating thing. So I'm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. sounds interesting. You got a card? Great, thank you. Turns out, if I agreed to let her get Malinche's products in all the big retailers, I would have probably gone bankrupt, closed the company down. Because, first of all, they want 60% off a list. That's your starting point. Then they want the right of returns. 
or no dice. I says, I'm not doing that. They'll beat it up, they'll tear them open, they'll discs missing, whatever. And the kiss of death was, because it's interactive fiction, and there is, to a newcomer, a learning curve of some degree, we said, how many people we have to hire to man the phones and the email boxes to take in all the inquiries, people that don't get it. You know, like, you know, take the axe or open the door or search the thing. You know, how many people, how much would the phone bill be? How much does the T3 cost? How many, how much more office space do we need? And when we're all done, we figured it out. And, you know, almost funny, we would actually net between one and two dollars a copy when you're all done with everything you need to do. And we told her, thanks, but no thanks. We will not be in Barnes and Noble and Borders and, you know, we'll, we'll take it out. But why? I says, well, I don't want to work for 10 bucks a day. <laughs> you know, no, not 10, but, you know, it's a dollar when you're all done with 34 95 it's a discount, you know, then all your people are paid, then all your, a dollar a copy, you have to sell an insane amount of copies to make any kind of money, when we, you know, so we said no, so we'll just do it our, our way, and, you know, so games equal graphics, oh, no, 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 uh, oh, you know, all engines, full reverse, we're not selling games anymore, we're selling interactive fiction, Howard is a writer, but since he's a programmer, he's an implementer, you know, turn the wheel, turn the wheel, because, you know, Year two, we hit that. You know, we were going adventure game route, game route, game, adventure game. You know, and uh, here's free advice for all my competitors out there. You know, go my way. They won't because they, they, you know, they, they think I'm like, you know, Satan or something. But, you know, that's, that's cool too. But uh, that's how you do it. You have to market it as, as a book because people read. If people like to read, will like interactive fiction. They do. You know, I, I'll give uh, a, a nice, out there, a nice buzzword, USP. You know, you know what they're Unique selling proposition. There's three jillion books released every year. Why are mine better? They're interactive. What does that mean? Well, it means that you are the main character of the story. You get inside the story. It's the next dimension of fiction. See, these are all Infocom hooks I'm giving you here. They had it. They, they knew exactly what to do. Go after the book market. It's vast. I don't mind 30 competitors in the book market because it's so huge you have to share it. You nobody could do it alone. It's impossible. You know, I mean, I, I love. I look forward to being a billionaire one day, and I can't wait to buy my yacht and pick out my hundred acre estate and wherever. But until I get there, which is not too long in the future, positive thinking. Um, you have to realize is that I sell interactive books, which happen to be text adventure games, which are interactive fiction. It's to me, it's one of the same. You know, although not every game is uh, interactive fiction, fiction or text adventure game, but the idea is the same. That that's who we go after. We go after book people. Like I'm not going to go over to uh, EB Games and go, "Hey, you want to sell text adventure games?" They're like, "What? <laughs> Are you high?" <laughs> Same thing. You know, you, you, I'm not going to find me in EB Games. You're not going to find Halo 2 and Barnes and Noble. I mean, that's the delineation. The demarcation is what do you read and what do you watch. And we're going with the reading crowd. That's where. That's where. That's the only place it makes you know, sense to be. Three years ago, two years ago, I actually still can't talk about it, which company, but a, a Gigunda candy company said, you know, when the iPod games came out, like, the office was like in chaos like a month. It was like, you know, it was cool. So this is a Gigunda candy company, and everybody sees their candy in every store every day in front of you. So that, that's your hint. Now figure out who it is. That's better talking. So this gigantic candy company says, we want you to make us mobile games and put them on every cell phone possible because that's what you do, right? Yeah, we see your website, you mobile games, trios, and, you know, uh, iPods. Yeah, you can do that for us. Cool. Okay, I, NDA, let's go have meetings. We have three conferences and da, 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 And you go, oh, it's text? I was like, like I said was, I was the F word, but... Anyway, are you fucking kidding me? You didn't see the website, the screenshots? You didn't read any of my copy? You didn't read anything about the any of the press release? Did you read? What did you think you were getting? Well, games. <laughs> <laughs> me and Jimmy, Jim, Jim, Jim Polanco, my sales director, said, well, that about wraps it up. <laughs> Happened again. I actually completed a project, a prototype for a gigantic ad agency in New York. I keep saying we're gigantic. I'll, I'll, I'll use another word. A very established, high-profile ad agency in New York City wanted us to write games for one of their bigger clients. And again, you will know them. They have several brands. 
consumer products, um, from deodorant to soap to you, you name it. There's, uh, I won't give too many hints out because they know, figure out who I'm talking about. It's a huge company. Much more than one. They actually had it for three other clients of mine. One makes jeans. And, uh, blah, 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 me and Jimmy walk in the city. You know, I bring over my power book and he, I, he is, he's, got, he's holding a palm. I have my Symbian Sony Ericsson phone and ready to rock. Text, huh? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks for me and take care. You know, yeah, okay, that's what we said. We're done. We sell interactive fiction. Spot on. You know, when, when we had those meetings and those people, and first they're excited, and like they must not know how to read to realize that we don't, <laughs> what we're producing here. Because how do you not get a clue without seeing it at the screen? Oh, text, huh? So that's what we decided. We're selling interactive fiction. We're catering to people that read. And if you can't read, we're not your we're not your company. And that's where we are today. And that's where we're going to be. And that is where any text adventure game company has to be today. If they hope to survive, they cannot go after gamers exclusively and think they're going to make it. They're not. It's game over for them. Graham Nelson talks about, you know, finding a bomb under the floorboards only after it blows up and you're dead. Yeah, that wouldn't be fair. I, I agree. It's not fair. But life isn't fair. Life imitates art. Art imitates life. You know, I will give the player a hint because they'll hear a ticking noise from a certain part of the floor. Uh, or, you know, the terrorist left a handwritten note. You know, terrorists write a lot. They actually leave behind a lot of evidence in their safe houses. So I say, well, in fact, I'm thinking of that now because I'm already doing ideas for Saints and Sin City, so I'm already kind of getting there. Um, I would write about that, but, you know, I think sometimes games need to be a little unfair because life isn't always fair. I, I bought a brand new company car. Uh, no, when was it? Last fall. Thing is three days old. Blindsided on Main Street in Matawan. Three grand in damage. The car is three blankety days old. I was berserk. And, um, or three, five hundred dollars in damage. It was almost four grand in damage. But it doesn't matter. The car was three days old. It's not fair. But it happened. Mm -hmm. It happened. You know, you know. Games are escapism. I do believe that games need to be fun and we need an escape, but we need to be plausible. Bad things can happen if we're not careful. Now, I do give players a rope. You know, you, you're not always stuck. But uh, it might not always be fair from their perspective. So, yeah, I will make games a little harder at some points if the point is there. Like an end game, there's a bomb in the engine room. You know, that's not a giveaway. That's part of the game. And I give the player two different ways to defuse it, but not a hell of a lot of time. That's, that's, to my view, that's fair. If a terrorist plants a bomb on a U.S. Navy warship, he ain't going to wait until he, it's a good time to blow it up. He's going to make it happen ASAP and get the ship sunk. So, fairness goes so far. And I do believe in it to a point of view, and I do subscribe to the point of view, but only to a point, as an example. And I think that commercially, the game needs to be sometimes occasionally ridiculous. Like the first mile gunman puzzle again. Um, most people understand it, and they go, yeah, you know, I shouldn't spoil it, but I was ready to splurt out what you should do or shouldn't do. I'll put it out there. I mean, why not? It's, it's fun. So, in the, so uh, the puzzle in the first mile is there's a gunman in the woods, I mentioned earlier. And um, he is frantic. He's got a loaded gun pointed at you, and he's ready to pull the trigger. He's sweating, he's talking fast, and he's, ta he's telling you things, and clear language is this, do not give me a reason to shoot you. Now, the player can do three things. They can walk away. This guy's, a, this guy's dangerous. They can take him out. Or they can solve the puzzle he represents. I won't say which is right or wrong, but of course he's there for a reason. He's a gunman. And actually, you should get past him. Not by shooting him, though, because that would, you know, ruin the rest. I'll leave it there for that. That's a spoiler. So, is it fair? This one lady, who I mentioned earlier, thought it was very unfair. And she ranted about it and read about it in the forums. And one of the forum administrators, hey, hey, Howard, this girl's really flaming you. You want to come in here and take a look at this. And I don't go every day. I'm busy. So I go in there and, and sure enough, and, you know, and I reply back, sweet as sugar, which is my usual demeanor, despite what you may have heard. <laughs> and um, 
And I ended up hearing, I heard her out, and she was not wrong in her feelings, of course. I don't agree with her opinion. And I said, you know, whatever. And, um, yeah, so it wasn't fair to her. And maybe that's the most vocal I've heard of from. So, yeah, it is unfair. But, hey, this guy pointed a gun at you. What are you going to do? Do something. You know, and take the hint so far. I mean, I'll give people a hint on what to do. If they ask me, and that's back to email me, because I want to know, is it too hard? Is it unfair? Is it unreasonable? And if it is, and really is, okay, I'll take it. I'll, I'll, I'll work with that. I'm easy. There, you know, we get a lot of good fan mail, and uh, each, each bit of it is very inspirational to me. And it's like, wow, I'm, I'm spot on. I got it. I know, I know where I am. I've got, I got my game on. I think the one that really broke the floodgates for me was an email from a uh, Zork fan. Love the games, every one of them. And I'll give you a few of those like that. But, you know, her name is Fran. In fact, I put her testimonial up in the main Pentari page. Better than any of the Zorks. I was like, cigar, cognac, champagne. You know, if somebody who liked and played those games can say that to me, I have achieved what I set out to do. Better than any of the Zorks. I was... I'm getting dizzy again. I'm getting the papers. No, okay. Seriously, it, it was that was a defining moment that told me is I have got there. I arrived. Now stay there and do better. Email like this girl named Debbie, also from the testimonial page. Um, few of them. I mean, loved it. Can't believe it. I'm so happy I found you. That's why I pay somebody to Google every month. To the, you want to Google Zork, you're going to find me. You can Google Infocom, you're going to find me. You know, I don't spend, I used to spend a lot of money in Google back in the well, 2005, we were doing a lot of experimenting with different approaches. So we found the ones that worked the best. And um, whenever we pick up a new fan like that, and oh, in fact, oh, wait, here's, here's a great one. My old friend Scott from Brooklyn, he was one of the buddies I used to play with a few blocks away with Infocom games. He, he was the guy that got belly, belly who. We were going over it. And I'm like, Scott, 50 bucks, man. I'm sorry. Yeah, but like next time. You know, it wasn't my, my favorite game. But you know, we still went through it. It's an Infocom game. We have to play it. It's inevitable. It's, um, so Scott emails me in the blue. He Googles Howard Sherman, number four in Google. Howard Sherman, Balenci. What the hell is this? He's writing text adventure games like Infocom? And he emails me, and I, and, uh, I ship him a full box of games, You know, not even a cost. Give it for free. Obviously, I'm a, good, I'm a nice guy. He plays them. He's playing my, my Azteca game. He goes, like, I swear I'm playing Infocom game. And that's for my buddy. And, of course, he's my buddy. So, but he told me if it sucks too, because that's, that's your buddy. I'll tell you the truth. You know, is it good or is it bad? And he told me, I swear I'm playing Infocom game. It's like I gave my friend the gift that uh, he has more of what we remember enjoying together. And um, that was another major one. Milestones. Um, well, I mean, I can give you lots of boring ones. The, the new packaging was a nice milestone because we were kind of amateurish back in the day. We were putting out some pretty. Well, the Greystone file wasn't bad, but the new packaging is nice. Then we went to a new CD design this year for CD delivery on, on our folio editions. That was nice. Operations-wise, the toll-free phone numbers, the office staff. I mean, I'm proud of all of it. I mean, it's I'm I mean, I'm proud of all of it. And milestone-wise, I there's so many over. Five, I'm five years Malinche in October, so there are many milestones. Um, they're all great. It's pretty nice. Pretty nice. It's a wild ride, and it's going to continue for a long time. Text adventure games, I think, were never dead. You know, that's one of the articles that comes out every day, every like every eight months. You know, why did the text adventure games die? Why why did not just text adventure games? Why did the adventure game die? And I'm like, okay, you want to get some new page views and impressions, so you get more Google clicks. And okay, I get it. But you know, the truth is, text adventure games never died. You know, that's viewed through one prism. If you look at text adventure games through the prism of the computer game industry, yeah, they're dead. Unless you're a retro fan or a classic game fan or Infocom fan, yeah, they're dead. You're gone, over with. But I um, mentioned earlier, there is a whole other market vastly more lucrative because of how expansive it is in the fiction book market. You have horror, mystery, thriller, you know, uh, you, even mysteries have sub-genres under mystery. You know, it's, it's incredible. It's almost endless. And that's your market. People are going to want to read 
interactive fiction is a unique kind of reading with the element of, inter of interaction. And I think, as Nick Montfort said, um, digital media, digital literature, you know, if you go after that sector, success is inevitable. And that's what Malinche is doing. We're not trying to go get the missed people to play our game. I mean, it's silly. You know, they want to point and click. They want to move things around. They want to, you know, and be done. Um, so going after the reader is how we can be assured that text adventure games are here to stay because we go to the right place because you get who you market to. If you market Zork to Halo 2 fans, you're going to have some very unhappy Halo 2 fans that are going to flame you and say this is this sucks and this isn't a game at all. And it happens at download.com. Go look for my games at download.com. Great reviews from those that understand what I'm doing and then the kids go, oh, this is a piece of shit, waste your time with it because they don't get it. So as long as everybody, fan, developer, amateur developer, anybody all remembers what you're creating, who could enjoy it, and then go there, then we can look at it through the prism of realizing that the text adventure game was never dead, it will never be dead, and actually has a very new lease on life with a whole new audience who have no idea what these things are. I mean, I, well, this is a perfect one. When Greystone came out... Um, Murder Mystery. I gave it out to Just Adventure, Adventure Gamers, you know, all the usual. And I gave it out to Murder Mystery book clubs, websites, and e-zines. And two of the most amazing stories and reviews came from people who were expecting to get a, you know, a, you know, initially a mystery book pitch from me. I said, no, this is interactive fiction. It's computer-based. No, no, we don't do computer games. No, it's not a computer game. It's interactive fiction. Well, explain it to me. Long story short, two copies get shipped out. One to uh, Sharon. I've got her last name already. So God forgive me. She's on the website. And Joy Spears. You know, different, you know, e-zines in the web. Very, 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 one scholar. Sharon's is really evidence. Joy Spears, Murder, May, and Book Club. They were blown away. Now, mind you, these two women did not know what it was. Never heard of it. No idea about it. They're just two mysteries. All done. Uh, Joy and Sharon were amazed. Now, if you're a mystery fan, what if you arrest this guy? What if you get this evidence? What if that you didn't pick up the fingerprint from the dusty flower pot behind the patio? That's on top of my head, by the way. Pretty cool. And uh, they were they were floored because of the possibilities present that would make being a detective more exciting. That you're not just you know reading a John Sanford novel, which is of course very good. He's an excellent writer, but that element of interactivity made the these murder mystery fans wake up to a very new and different possibility for what fiction can become. So text adventure games are, are here for the long term. Thank God.